Okay, so now we're gonna delve into the explanations. So we have the initial revolution, we covered what it is, and we're gonna have three different explanations that broadly correspond to our three broader explanations about growth. We have an institutional argument coming from Asimoglu, Doug North, Joel Mokir. We have a geographic argument that is um, premised on the fact that Britain has large coal reserves. So this is why it's called the resource wage argument. Resource being the key one here. This comes from Bob Allen, Ken Pomerantz. We have a cultural argument that I'm not really going to touch on in depth, but you know you could broadly classify the proponents of this as Landis, Greg Clark, and then um, Joel Mokir, who is also kind of he's kind of in both camps with his 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 variety of work. Okay, so the institutional argument. All right, and so this argument, as I've covered, really thinks that what's important for growth are what what is characterized as inclusive economic institutions these are things like property rights law and order um kind of public goods and uh uh you know the the support of the uh uh for markets that, that markets need to function um free entry contracts education essentially you're creating the incentives so that individuals can invest and innovate. Now, most societies don't have these. The norm is actually more extractive institutions. Um, you know, elites kind of uh, being able to expropriate or take whatever they want. Um, generally, not really good access to education, kind of, um, you know, a court system that favors, or heavily favors um, the elite. This is kind of the, the norm. Um, but you really, if you, in order to have growth, you really need the inclusive institutions. So why don't we have them? Well, they typically uh, will not benefit uh, the, the elite. So th if you have inclusive institutions, you're going to get growth. What, what does growth mean? It means new technology. New technology is going to displace an existing company. Um, so there will be economic losers. These are traditionally like the old economic elite. So they're not going to favor anything that increases their competition, that increases, you know, competition, uh, you know, in the form of other companies. So they're not going to really favor free entry uh, into the market for their for their competition or just a broadly fair competitive market. Typically, they also have. Um, typically, they will, you know, as part of these inclusive institutions, democracy. And so these will create political rulers. You can get voted out of office now um, or you'll have term limits. And so the reason extractive institutions are the norm is that the elites, the economic and political elites, stand to lose by having these sorts of inclusive uh, institutions. Um, all right. And so, sorry. All right. Okay. Sorry. Got to get my LaCroix here. It's pretty hot. Pretty hot. Not paid for this, not an influencer, just enjoy uh, 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 LaCroix. All right. And so these are really the barriers. Like if you look at a, a, a poor country today, you can, people say, why don't they just change their institutions? Well, oftentimes the existing institutions, the extractive institutions are really beneficial to that country's political or economic elite. So there's no incentive. There's no incentive for them to change things, um, you know, s such that uh, uh, growth would come. Okay. And so, as I mentioned, extractive institutions are really the norm, especially in the past. In the present, you do have many countries that have inclusive institutions. Obviously, no country is perfect um, in terms of like they have like great inclusive institutions across the board. You can, usually it's like a spectrum. Uh, but in the present, we have many countries that are, are, you know, have inclusive institutions or at least closer to inclusive institutions. You can think of the U.S. The U.S. has pretty, it's not perfect, but pretty inclusive institutions. Um, you know, in, you know, historically it's had, it, 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 it has had that. Although we talked a little bit how, how those institutions have been differentially uh, applied um, early on in the course. Okay, so where do they come from basically, all right? So there's typically some sort of conflict or there's turning points where there's an opportunity to adopt a more inclusive institution by kind of a new, a new power structure coming into uh, place. You could think of the American Revolution where, you know, the American Revolution happens and there's this opportunity to, to create a whole new 
set of institutions. Now, largely those institutions in, in the U.S. are based on British institutions, um, but there is some there is some there are some new ones that were that were put into place. Uh, you know, the uh, democracy being one of them. All right. And so in, what happens in England, basically the argument with England is, you know, this glorious revolution is really uh, important in that they implement several inclusive uh, institutions. OK. And this really sets the stage for growth. This is Doug North's hypothesis. Uh, North wine gas, sorry, hypothesis. Um, okay, and so really, you know, they put that into place. And Britain is sort of this unique case where it has a series of critical junctures where the king loses power. And so, you know, by the time we get to um, the Glorious Revolution, you know, that's kind of like a culmination. It's like a steady loss of power. Um, and then they implement all sorts of institutions that are favorable to the merchant class. We've already covered this paper um, in uh, 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 last week or two weeks ago. You know, this paper talks about how that Atlantic trade really strengthened the merchant class and allowed the merchant class to kind of win the Glorious Revolution. And then they're able to implement the institutions they like, which are much more uh, inclusive, but the, the Britain already had more inclusive institutions than um, other countries in that time period, other societies at that then that time period, dating all the way back to uh, the Magna Carta. Um, you know, there's a famous story about uh, uh, England in World War II. So World War II, you know, you, you all know about World War II. Hopefully, if not, hop on Wikipedia, read about World War II, um, and so. You know uh, they're about to invade. Uh, they're about to invade France. So they're about to D Day is about to happen, um, and the King of England, the King of England's like, all right, I'm the King of England. Um, you know I want to lead the troops. I want to be you know with the troops as we you know retake France um, and push the Nazis back. All right. And so by this point, by the World War II, by the 1940s, the King had really lost power. And he's pretty much just a figurehead uh, at this point. You know, you can see the king is steadily losing power throughout, you know, British history. They lose, you know, they lose power with the Magna Carta, and then they really lose power with the Glorious Revolution. And then, of course, a series of reforms have really turned uh, the monarchy into what it is today, which is just like, I don't know what the monarchy in, in Britain is. It's like they're soap operas. Who knows? Um, but it's just a figurehead, right? But he's still the king. So he's like, I want to be with my troops. I want to lead them into battle. And, uh, you know, as, as, you know as, we, as, as, we, as, we, as we kick these Nazis back to, you know, back to Germany. So he goes to the prime minister, Winston Churchill. He says, you know, Winston, yeah, you got to, you know, I want to be with the troops, whatever. Winston's like, get out of here. Like, you know, F off. Like, we don't, no, no. You're just like, nobody cares about you. Go, go back to your castle, all right? You're not going to lead the troops. That's stupid just, you know, doesn't, doesn't do what he says, right? So the king's rebuffed, you know, he's driving back, he's driving back to, uh, to uh, you know, whatever it's called, wherever the king lives in, uh, lives, lives in England. They drive past the field where the Magna Carta is signed. And the king turns to his driver, he was, and he was like, he was like, it was in that effing field um, that, just you know that that everything turned that everything started to go to crap in this and he used the word crap but you know he's a different word started to go to crap in this country so i mean even he recognized that really this is you know he's part of this long legacy of steadily losing power that dates all the way back to the uh the magna carta all right and so if we go back to my lecture when i first kind of introduced these ideas if we go to england at the onset of the industrial revolution they have a lot of these things. They have a lot of these institutions that you need for entrepreneurship, that you need to come up with new inventions, come up with new innovations. They got human capital, all right? We, we covered that. A lot of them know how to read because of the Protestant religion. So we got widespread literacy. Um, we have some basic like numeracy too, scientific numeracy coming out of the scientific revolution. We got pretty good property rights for the time period. There's like this, uh, this movement called enclosure, which kind of leads to more private property. We have a Bank of England. We have some functioning capital markets. Um, we have pretty good contract enforcement. We have like a functioning legal system, the British common law system. And we have fairly equal market access. So Britain, and this is, this is kind of unique for, um, you know, for this time period, or it's actually almost wholly unique for this time period that we have all of these institutions in play that really allow for 
um, innovation. And also, you remember back to the last lecture, we had this idea, this Baconian idea, this Enlightenment idea that, hey, we can improve our situation. Um, and so that is basically the institutional argument uh, as it pertains to the Industrial Revolution, that Britain led the world in inclusive institutions, therefore, and they had probably the most inclusive institutions in human history up to that point, and therefore, they are the first to get growth. We will talk about the resource wage one next time. Stay tuned.